Our Father who is in heaven, we're thankful for another day of life and health and strength. We're thankful for another opportunity to study from your word and draw strength and encouragement from it. Father, we pray that you will bless us as your people. We pray, Father, for our country uh, during this very uncertain and chaotic time. We pray for our government leaders, those who are in positions of authority, that you will bless them at this time and give them wisdom. And Father, we just pray that you will receive the glory and honor in all things that we do, not only during this time of study, but in our everyday lives. Help us always shine the light of Christ to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today is the Lord's Day. Today is a day that God has made, and may God bless you for tuning in uh, for this Bible study video. I certainly appreciate it. I've been very thankful and encouraged over the past few months as we've been able to study the Word of God together. We've been studying from the book of 1 John over the past four weeks. We've studied the first four chapters of 1 John, and in those chapters, the main thing I hope you've been able to, to see is John's main goal uh, in the book of 1 John seems to be providing us with the information uh, that we need to know to be able to have confidence when it comes to our relationship with God. Uh, in the first four chapters of 1 John, we've learned that if we really want to know God, if we really want to be in fellowship with God as we walk through this life, then we need to do certain things. We need to walk in the truth. We need to walk in the light. We need to walk according to the word of God. We need to keep the commandments of God. We need to abstain from sin and wicked behavior. We don't need to live our lives willfully sinning against God. We need to avoid loving the world. We need to avoid being deceived by false teachers. We need to make sure that we love our brothers and our sisters in Christ. These are the things that we've learned in the first four chapters of the book of 1 John. And again, these things are written down for us so that we can have confidence in our relationship and fellowship with God. And so we want to conclude the book today. We want to conclude the book of 1 John. And then over the next couple of classes after today, we're going to study 2 John and 3 John. But in 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse number 1, the Apostle John concludes the book with these words. He says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. For who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he who has testified, that he has testified concerning his Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself, and the one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have, does not have the life. Okay, let's say a few things about these, these verses and the meaning of these verses. The first thing I want us to notice is, going back to verse number 1, 
We need to really highlight highlight that language that John uses when he talks about being born of God. Do you see that? He says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. One of the things that I hope you have noticed so far in these studies is this idea of being born of God. That is an idea or, or language that John uses frequently throughout this book. Throughout this book, John refers to God's people as those who have been born of God. In 1 John chapter 2 and in verse number 29, in 1 John 2 and verse number 29, John says, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 9, chapter 3 and verse number 9, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In chapter 4 and verse number 7, in chapter 4 and verse 7, John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And then another book that was written by the Apostle John, the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, not 1 John, but the Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse number 3. John 3 and verse number 3. Jesus, or John records this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And Jesus answered, John 3 and verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, he said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water, the idea of water there is water baptism. Unless one is born of water and the spirit, the idea there is being born again or converted by the teachings revealed by the spirit, which is the word of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What I just want to highlight for, for the purpose of this study is how John uses this language being born of God or being born again over and over again throughout his writings. Throughout his writings, he, he talks about being born of God, being born again. And that language that John uses is being used just to talk about being in a relationship with God, being in fellowship with God, being adopted into God's family and becoming a son or daughter of God. John says that if we are really sons and daughters of God, if we are really born of God, then we have to do certain things. And going back to 1 John 5 and verse 1, notice how he says that if we're really born of God, that, if that really describes us, then that means we, we believe in Jesus. We believe that Jesus is the Christ. We believe that he is the Messiah that was foretold by the prophets and came into this world. When John talks about believing that Jesus is the Christ, the idea there really is that if we're really born of God, we, we believe everything that the gospel says about Jesus. We believe that he was born of a virgin. We believe that he performed miracles and that he lived a sinless life and that he died on a cross for the sins of the world because he is the savior. We believe that he's the son of God. We believe that he's the king of kings and lord of lords. We believe that he was raised from the dead on the third day and that he has ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. John says that those who are truly born of God, they believe what the gospel says about Jesus. They believe that he is the Christ. And not only do they believe in Jesus, but they also love the Father. They love God the Father. And because they love God the Father, they also love those who have been born of God the Father. When John talks about loving those Loving those children who are born of God, he's talking about fellow citizens in the kingdom. 
He's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ, people who just like us have also been born again of water in the spirit. John says those who are truly the children of God, they love God, they love God's family, they believe in Jesus Christ, and they also keep God's commandments. Verse number two again, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. This is very similar to something else John wrote in one of his one of his books, the Gospel of John, chapter 14 and verse 15. And John 14 and verse 15, John quotes Jesus when Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You see, those who are truly born of God, those who are truly the children of God, they love God and they demonstrate that love by keeping his commandments, and they keep God's commandments because God's commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. The idea of God's commandments not being burdensome is the idea that God is not given, has not given us a standard or a book of commandments that are impossible for us to obey. The word of God, the standard of the gospel, it is not an impossible standard. It is not a standard that is impossible for us to attain to. God's commandments are not burdensome. God knows us better than we know ourselves, and the instructions found in his word or instructions that we can obey, we can keep them. And when we keep God's commandments, we not only demonstrate our love for him, but we also put ourselves on a path to live a life of peace and happiness. We put ourselves on a path to to receive fulfillment, not only in this life, but more importantly, in the life to come. John says that if we're really born of God, then we are to keep the commandments of God. God's commandments are not burdensome. They are commandments that that we can keep, and if we keep them, we'll experience peace and happiness and fellowship with God And then beginning with verse number four, beginning with verse number four, John has some things to say about our faith. You see, when we obey the word of God, we're really demonstrating faith in the word of God. And Paul says in Romans 10 and verse 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want Bible faith, then you got to get it from the Bible. And when you get that Bible faith, John says you have something that is more valuable than all the treasures of the world. You have Bible faith, John says, you're able to experience blessing and and victory. You can receive victory over the world. When John talks about the world here and us having victory over the world, he's talking about the sinful things of the world. He, he's talking about all the things of this world that threaten our fellowship with God. When we have faith that pleases God, we're able to experience victory over all of the sinful things of this world. We're able to experience victory over Satan, who is the prince of the power of the air, who is who is the ruler of of this world, because more people are under his influence than they are the influence of God. When we have faith, we can experience victory over our great adversary, the devil. And we can also experience victory over sin and over persecution and over temptation and over anything that is evil in the eyes of God. Through our faith in Jesus Christ, through our faith in the gospel, we can experience victory over all the sinful things of this world. And then John also says that our faith, this faith that gives us victory, that leads us to victory, it's not a blind faith. It's not a a weak faith or a hopeless faith. Instead, it's a sure faith. It is a faith that can be verified to the reasonable mind by three very important things. 
John says the three things, the three things that verify our faith in Jesus Christ are the water, the blood, and the spirit. I'm looking at verses 6 down to verse number 8. John says that our faith is our faith in Jesus Christ is verified by three things: water, blood, and the spirit. Someone says, What in the world are those things? What is the water? What is the blood? What is the spirit? And how do these three things connect to Jesus Christ? How do these things verify the identity of Jesus Christ? Well, my friends, when you study the gospel very carefully, you see very clearly that these three things, water, blood, and spirit, tie directly to Jesus Christ. And when we examine the evidence they give us, they verify 100% that he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And so let's talk about him. The water. What is the water a reference to here? Well, the water here clearly is representing the baptism of Jesus. It is referring to what happened when Jesus was baptized in water by John the Baptist. You see, when Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness in the Jordan River, there was an event that took place that gave John the evidence he needed to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. When you read Matthew chapter 3, Verses 13 to verse 17, you see that when Jesus was baptized in the water, when he was immersed in the water, once he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove, and God the Father spoke directly out of heaven. He said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am pleased. And so what happened when Jesus came up out of the water was evidence Strong evidence, undeniable evidence that he is the Christ, the Son of God. The water represents the baptism of Jesus. And then the blood, the blood represents the events that happened around the cross. The blood represents all the things that took place on this world, or in, and specifically in Jerusalem, after Jesus shed his blood on the cross for the remission of our sins. You see, when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, the gospel tells us that the sun was darkened. There was darkness throughout the land. And there was also an earthquake. The Bible says the earth trembled. And the Bible also says that the veil of the temple was torn in two. And the Bible also says that the dead were raised. And then even Jesus was raised. Jesus was raised three days after he shed his blood on the cross. You see, there were some supernatural acts that occurred when Jesus shed his blood. And the many of the people who saw these supernatural acts, they, they knew what they they, what they knew what they confirmed and represented in Matthew chapter 27 and in verse number 54. In Matthew 27 and verse number 54, the Bible says, Now the centurion, this was a centurion that was near Jesus when he was dying on the cross. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, Truly, this was the Son of God. The events that surrounded the cross, the supernatural events, that was evidence God was giving to confirm the identity of his Son. The water represents the baptism of Jesus. The blood represents the events surrounding the death of Jesus. And then the Spirit. The Spirit represents the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you see, in addition to the water and the blood, the Holy Spirit also testifies of Jesus. He also testifies and verifies that Jesus is the Christ. He, he did that in, in numerous ways throughout the whole Bible. He did that through the Old Testament prophets, prophets like Daniel and Isaiah 
and Micah and Hosea, when the prophets gave predictions hundreds of years in advance concerning the Messiah Jesus, they were giving those predictions or those prophecies by the power of the Holy Spirit. They were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as they prophesied about Jesus. The Holy Spirit was speaking through them. And then remember again the baptism of Jesus when the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove to verify that Jesus was God's son. And then remember the, the revelations given to the apostles. The apostles wrote the New Testament. And as they wrote about Jesus, as they taught about Jesus, they were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In John 16, Jesus told them that he was going to send the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, and he would guide them into all the truth concerning him. And then the miracles performed by Jesus. As Jesus performed miracles on this earth, the Holy Spirit was with him. And the Holy Spirit was working through him and with him as he confirmed his identity through the miracles. And then remember the events of Pentecost, how Acts chapter 2 opens up by telling us about the time when, when the Holy Spirit's power came upon the apostles and they began to, to speak in tongues. They began to speak in foreign languages that they had never formally learned. And the people, when they heard and saw them do that, they knew that something amazing was taking place. And then Peter preached the gospel about, of Jesus Christ to these people, and 3,000 people were baptized. All of that work in Acts 2 was jump-started by the work of the Holy Spirit. The water, the blood, the spirit, the baptism of Jesus, the events surrounding the cross, the testimony and the work of the Holy Spirit, these things testify of the identity of Jesus. These things shout to us that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. This is the testimony of the gospel. And John says in verses 9 through 10 of 1 John 5 that we need to believe this testimony. We need to believe this testimony and this evidence that has been given to us by God. You know, it is interesting how under the Old Testament law of Moses, God required that there be two or three witnesses to verify the truth concerning sinful accusations. Before someone was, was punished under the law, there had to be two or three witnesses to verify the accusation. This was a big part of the old law of Moses. And John's point is, if we will believe the testimony of two or three witnesses that are men, that are human, then how much more so should we believe the three pieces of testimony that God has given concerning Jesus? God is meeting the standard that he came up with under the old law. Two or three witnesses were required to provide testimony when accusations were brought up under the law. And in the same way, God has given us three pieces of testimony to verify that Jesus is his son, the water and the spirit and the blood. And we should believe God's testimony. In verses 11 through 12, John says that if we believe this testimony given concerning Jesus, then in verse 11, he says we'll receive eternal life. We'll receive the eternal life that is only found in Jesus. But if we don't believe this testimony that has been given from God, he says we won't have life. We won't have eternal life. We won't have a relationship with God now or in the next life. Verse 11, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son, if you believe the testimony, you have life, but he who does not have the Son. If you don't have the, 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 believe the testimony, you won't have a relationship with God's Son, and you won't have life. This reminds me of something else John wrote in one of his books. I'm going to the Gospel of John. You know, as I've been studying this, it's just been amazing to me 
how connected John's writings are to one another. John touches on many of the same things throughout his writings. And in John 20 and verse 30, in John 20 and verse 30, John says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Notice how John says there that there are a lot of miracles Jesus performed while he was on this earth. There are just so many things that he did that we don't even know about, but the things that were recorded for us to know are there to provide us with the evidence we need to believe in his identity. They are there to provide us with the evidence we need to believe he's a son of God, and then as a result, give our complete lives to him. John says that God has given us evidence. God has given us evidence concerning his son. I really like that, brothers and sisters, because it shows me that when it comes to our faith, when it comes to this faith we are to possess that will enable us to overcome the world, this faith we are to have is not a blind faith. It is, it is not a, a faith that, that is developed by just blindly believing in, believing in something because we want it to be true or we hope it is true. It is not a faith that is not a faith that is based based upon something that doesn't have sufficient evidence. Instead, the faith we have as Christians is a faith that is based upon evidence. It is based upon testimony, testimony of eyewitnesses. Testimony of people who were willing to die because they believed that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was raised from the dead. They said, we saw him. We saw him raised and were willing to die proclaiming that message. It is a faith that is based upon the baptism of Jesus and how someone was there to hear God himself declare that Jesus is his son. It is a faith that is based upon miraculous events that took place when Jesus died on the cross. It is evidence based on the work of the Holy Spirit and the revelation given by the Spirit and the miracles that the Holy Spirit enabled messengers to perform to confirm that they were, in fact, preachers from God. Our faith is based on evidence, not a blind faith. It is based on evidence. It is a rock solid and strong faith. It is a faith that will lead us to eternal life. And so John says, you have a strong faith if you're a Christian. And your faith needs to be based on evidence. But then let's conclude with this. Verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know. I have that word know underlined and highlighted in my Bible so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. We know that no one who is born of God, there that language is again, sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Okay. Let's say a few things about this text here. And this is a complicated text. Let's say a few things about it just to kind of uh, give an overview of what's going on here, and that's going to be the video. First, look at verse number 13. Verse number 13 deals with the topic of confidence. 
confidence and assurance. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Here John is saying that when it comes to your relationship with God, if you're a Christian, when it comes to your fellowship with God, you being a child of God, God doesn't want you to walk around in your life doubting that reality. God doesn't want you to walk around in your life in fear, thinking to yourself, well, I can't know where I I stand before God until the judgment day or until the, the day I die. God does not want you to feel that way. God doesn't want you to live that way. Jesus is not coming to this world and die on a cross so that you can walk around living your life in doubt. John says God wants you to know. God wants you to know right now as you live on this earth that you know him. That you have a relationship with him. That you have eternal life. God wants you to know that right now. And John says, I wrote this stuff down. And all the other gospel writers wrote their message down so we can have that. God wants us to have confidence in regards to our salvation. As Sean Jeffries walks around in this life, God wants me to know right now that I have eternal life that I am ready for the return of Jesus, that I am ready to die, that I am ready for the judgment day because I love him, I keep his commandments, I love my brethren, I don't fall for the, the teachings of false teachers, I walk in the truth, I walk in love, I walk in the light. If I just do what God tells me to do to the best of my ability and try to keep my heart pure and holy, God says I can live my life right now knowing That heaven is my home. God says I can live with that. Even though at times I mess up. Even though I don't know all the Bible. Even though I'll never know all the Bible. I can still live my life with confidence. If I just do my best to be faithful to God. That's what John says. God wants me to have confidence when it comes to my salvation. And he wants you to have that. And he also wants you to have confidence when it comes to your prayers. When you look at verses 14 through 15, John says that in addition to having confidence when it comes to our salvation, God also also wants us to have confidence when it comes to bringing our requests before him. He wants us to know that because we're his children, because we have fellowship with him, that when we pray to him, he will not only hear our prayers, but he will respond to our prayers according to his will. John says we can have confidence in that as well. In fact, speaking of prayer, in the next few verses, in verses 16 and 17, John has some things to say about prayer. And I want to suggest that those two verses there, 16 and 17, are said by many to be some of the most difficult verses in the Bible. They're said to be very complicated verses, difficult passages that are given in the New Testament. And so, Let's reread them again. John says, if anyone sees his brother, and remember, this book has been talking about brotherly love. Love for your brother, love for your sister. If you see your brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask God, pray. This is the idea of prayer. And God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests of this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Now, maybe you read that and you go, what in the world is John talking about there? What is John talking about in those verses? What is is the sin not leading to death? And why should we pray? For someone who is committing the sin not leading to death. And what is the sin that does lead to death? And why does John say don't pray for the person committing the sin that leads to death? What is the sin not leading to death? What is the sin that does lead to death? These are difficult verses. And I honestly could spend an hour talking about these verses. But I'm going to try to simplify this as much as I can to the best of my ability in about two two to three or four minutes, okay? May even be longer than that because I do have the recent verses that I hope can, can back up the case. But these are difficult passages. And so 
it is my understanding and my belief that if, you, if we're going to understand what John is saying here, we need to make sure we harmonize what he's saying here with everything else found in the Bible, especially with everything else he says in this very same book. And so let's start with the first, the first topic or the first thing we need, to, we need to consider, and that is this. What kind of death is John talking about? He talks about the sin leading to death, the sin not leading to death. What kind of death is he referring to? Well, I want to say that in my understanding that when John talks about death here, he's not talking about physical death. While it is true that some sins can lead to physical death. I mean, if you drink and drive, you could get in a car accident and die. If you commit sexual immorality, if you're sexually promiscuous, you could catch AIDS and die. So there are certain sins that do lead to death, physical death. But I don't think John is talking about physical death here. And so he'll talk about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death. He's talking about the same kind of death that Paul talks about in Romans 6 and verse 23, when Paul says the wages of sin is death. When, talk, when Paul says the wages of sin is death there, he's not talking about physical death. Instead, he's talking about spiritual death. He's saying that when we commit sin, we deserve a wage, and the wage is spiritual death, eternal separation from God. In Romans 6 and verse 23, he's not talking about physical death because even little babies sometimes, unfortunately, experience physical death, and they're not sinners. He's talking about spiritual death. The wages of sin is spiritual death. And so with that in mind, let me just say this. The sin that doesn't lead to death, while, while it is true the wages of sin is death, spiritual death, according to what John is saying back in the context of 1 John, and when you harmonize what he's saying with everything else he says in that book, I think the conclusion we have to make is the sin that doesn't lead to death is the sin that a person is willing to repent of. When a person commits a sin and they repent of that sin and confess that sin, they're not going to experience the wage for sin, which is death. That's the sin that doesn't lead to death. In fact, you got to harmonize that with 1 John 1 verse number 7. 1 John 1 and verse 7, John says, remember, this is the same guy, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Notice how John says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us not just from some sins, but from all sins. All sins. There's no sin that you've committed in your life that the blood of Jesus won't cleanse, but you've got to be willing to do something to get that cleansing. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we, we as Christians, confess our sins, he referring to God as faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us not just from some unrighteousness, but from all unrighteousness. You have to harmonize what John is saying in those verses to what he's saying in 1 John 5. In 1 John 1, John says that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sins. It will cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we do what? If we confess the sin. If we repent of the sin, that is the sin that doesn't lead to death. The sin that you confess, the sin that you repent of. If you confess your sins and repent of your sins... The blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You won't receive eternal damnation. You won't receive spiritual death. But by contrast, going back to 1 John 5, the sin that you won't repent of, the sin that you willfully harbor yourself in and wallow in, the sin that you are arrogant about and you refuse to acknowledge before your heavenly father and repent of that sin will lead you to death you will receive spiritual death if you don't seek the forgiveness of God and humble yourself before him what John is saying here is no different than what we study when we when we consider the book of Hebrews remember Hebrews Hebrews 6 
We studied Hebrews for several weeks. This should be nothing new to us here. Hebrews 6 and verse 4. Hebrews 6 and verse 4. Here the Hebrew writer is talking about Christians. And he says, for in the case of those who have once in, been enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. These are people who become Christians, people who have been baptized, people who are part of the family of God. Verse 5, they tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then they fall away. They reject the truth, and they know better. He says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify themselves, the Son of God, and put him to open shame. The Hebrew writer there is talking about the same thing that John talks about in 1 John 5. He's making a contrast between those, who, those Christians who are willing to confess their sins and repent of their sins and get their lives right with God, and God will forgive those people. He's contrasting those people to the people who, who are Christians, but they willfully live in sin, they reject the truth, they fall away, and nothing will bring them to repentance. Their hearts are too hardened. See, Christians with that mindset, with that arrogant mindset, who willfully sin against God and refuse to repent, there's no hope for those people. There's no hope for those people. In fact, it's so bad that John says that you shouldn't even pray for those people because your prayers are not going to do anything for them until they decide in their hearts to humble themselves before God. You see, if you're a Christian and you sin against God, if you humble yourself and repent and confess your sin, your sin, even though you've committed it, God will forgive it. And you won't have to receive spiritual death, but if you're a Christian and you sin against God and you shake your fist at heaven and you have an arrogant spirit, an arrogant attitude, and you won't confess it and repent, then your sin will lead you to spiritual death. And our prayers for you won't do any good. And so we need to pray for those Christians who come to us seeking prayers because they want to ask God to forgive them for sins. We need to pray for those Christians. And as Christians that may commit sin from time to time, we don't need to be ashamed to request those prayers. There's nothing wrong with that, to ask our brothers and sisters to pray for us because we sinned against God and we need his forgiveness. The Bible says we need to pray for one another in those cases, but for the Christian who's living a life of rebellion and refuses to turn from the error of their ways, there's no point in praying for those people. Those people have arrogant hearts, arrogant spirits, and unless, until they reach the point where they want to change, they're on a path where their sin is going to lead them to death, spiritual death. That's the best way I know how to put it. John is making a distinction here between the humble and the prideful. Christians who want to confess their sins won't receive spiritual death. But Christians who refuse to do so, they will suffer the consequences of their sins. That's what John is talking about in my understanding. And then in verses 18 through 21, John concludes the book after talking about how we need to pray for those who are willing to repent of their sins. And we don't need to pray for those who want to live lives of rebellion against God. John then talks about some, some final blessings that come with being a, being a child of God. In addition to being able to avoid the wages of sin, which is death. John also says we can receive protection from the evil one, verses 18 through 19. You're in the loving arms of God. You receive protection from God against your enemy, the devil. You get to know God. You get to be in God. And ultimately, John says in verse 20, you get to receive eternal life in Christ Jesus. John then concludes the book by saying, guard yourself against idols. What is an idol? Well, an idol is not just the little statues that people in the Old Testament would bow down and worship. An idol is anything that you put before God. Anything that you, you put before God is an idol. And unfortunately, since the very beginning of time, God's people have always had a problem with idols. Idols are a problem for us today, and we need to guard ourselves against idols. We need to be weary of putting anything, whether it's a family member, a possession, a political party, anything. We need to guard ourselves 
against putting anything before our Heavenly Father. Guard yourself against idols because idolatry is a trap that is easy, easy to fall into. Now, that's our studies in 1 John, and I really appreciate you studying with me. I hope these studies will be beneficial to you. I hope the main thing that you'll take away is it is a blessing to be born of God. It is a blessing to be a child of God. And let us always do the things that John says we must do in order to live our lives with the confidence that God wants us to have. Thank you.